Good morning. Welcome to another exciting morning of chemistry with your host, me, Dr. White. Now, as I just mentioned to one of your colleagues that, let me pin my video, right now I'm having sewer work done outside my house. If they need me, they'll ring my doorbell and uh, I'll go out there and I'll have to take a little break. But and also end early because about 1130, the cement guys are coming by to give me a quote, but they're recommended by the company I'm using. So I have faith in them. By the way, if you ever need a um, plumbing done, there's a great company in the uh, Schomburg and also uh, COD area. It's called JNS Plumbing. I've used them a number of times over the years. These guys are fantastic. They're not the cheapest, but they're the best. So if you ever need plumbers, JS Plumbing, uh, if you forget, email me, I'll tell you. I'll recommend, I recommend them to everyone. All right, now I'm gonna do things a little differently because I might get called away. Today, I'm gonna go through the lab you're, we're gonna be doing today. Then I'll do the problem set and good news. We're ahead of things, or not ahead, we're on, on track. So I'll be starting chapter 11, which will be on test three, not test two. Reminder, test number two will be a week from today. I'll be sending out the password. And um, let's see, I'll by Sunday afternoon at the latest, I'll post uh, information about test number two. It will uh, cover the chapters which we've done already. And we've already gone through, as of Tuesday, all the practice problems. I would highly recommend you do chapter eight practice problems, the three-step mold problems, and the other things. Do them, because test number two historically is the lowest average. Not always, I've had three classes where it's one of the highest ones, but those classes listened to Dr. White and did all the practice problems, especially anything to do with moles. Dr. White loves moles and they love me too, but do them. Also, I uh, won't put in the uh, announcement, but I've mentioned it and I'll mention again, on test number two, there'll be historically, I got to write it this weekend too, but when I write it, there's always four balanced chemical equations, three points each, so 12 points, know how to do that. And with that, let's get to what we'll first of all, I see. All right, I think I'm up to date on everybody's question. What I'd like to start first is with the lab. So everybody put on your safety goggles, no, I'm just kidding. If we we're in the lab, we would. All right, thumbs up, people. Do you see lab number seven on your screen now? Thank you. All right. Have you ever wondered how chemists know water is H2O? sodium chloride table salt is NaCl. They went into the lab and did that. And how they do that, and this is an in inorganic, I-N-O-R-G-A-N-I-C, inorganic chemistry. We call that the empirical formula. Water H2O, that's the empirical formula. Water, sodium chloride, NaCl, empirical formula of salt, table salt. Please pass the navel. All right, now today's lab, and if we were in COD, you'd be doing this. We're, you're gonna find out what is the empirical formula for magnesium oxide. And how do you do that? Well, you're gonna be running if we were, first of all, magnesium oxide has an empirical formula of MGXOY. I'll write it up here. And today's lab, you're going to find out what is X, what is Y. 
Remember, those are exact numbers. They're always whole numbers because you can't have 1.2 atoms of oxygen, say, or 3.5 atoms of magnesium. So today's lab, you're going to figure out what is X, what is Y, to find out the empirical formula of magnesium oxide. How do you do that? Well, it turns out air, which has oxygen, and if we look at reaction one, we'll react to make magnesium oxide. And again, you're going to figure out what's X, what's Y. And to make this go quicker, you heat it up with a Bunsen burner. Now, unfortunately, in air, has oxygen and nitrogen gas. And it turns out magnesium oxide or magnesium can react with nitrogen to make this magnesium nitride. And to eliminate what we call a side reaction in the reaction, if you were in the lab today, while you're heating this up, you would add a little water and this converts this to what we're trying to get to, and it makes ammonia, which is given off as a gas, and you'd be able to smell that. Stinky, but you'd smell it. And this is how chemists would go into the lab and have an early eons of chemistry to find out what is the empirical formula for magnesium oxide, plus all the other inorganic they did that, and sometimes they'll use another way called gravimetric analysis. But today, you're going to do a straight empirical formula determination. And what is an important to determine this is the concept for this, one mole of an element. Hang on, I got to turn off spell check so you don't see all those squiggly lines because Microsoft Word doesn't like chemical words that well. Squiggly line gone. One mole of an element equals the atomic weight in grams of an element. And in order to determine, you'll use this knowledge in order to determine the empirical formula magnesium oxide. Now, there's this great YouTube video. Let's take a look at it for a second. In this lab, you will experimentally determine the empirical formula for magnesium oxide. You'll do this by combusting magnesium in an oxygen-rich environment. All right, Professor, we don't see it. All right. To begin, you'll Hang need on. I should ask my thumbs up, people. Tells me you should see it, but do you see a picture of a balance on the screen now? Thank you for whoever let me know. I appreciate it. And let's go to you be doing this. You can go look at it on your own, but what you'll be doing if you were in the lab today is we well, need to make sure that the Bunsen burner is close enough to the crucible to heat it well. The high temperature will cause the magnesium to ignite, but first the crucible will begin to glow with the heat. Raising the lid of the crucible will allow oxygen from the air to enter the crucible. This is will ignite cool? the magnesium causing formation of magnesium not. oxide. Do not look directly at burning magnesium. The intense light can damage your eyes. During this reaction, you will want to ensure that oxygen gets in for the reaction to take place. You can either do this by tilting the lid off the crucible slightly to allow oxygen to flow, or raising and lowering the lid periodically. Be sure not to let the reaction smoke too much. Any smoke coming out of the system is actually a loss of product. Allow the reaction to proceed, periodically checking on it to see whether or not ignition occurs when the lid is raised. When ignition finally ceases, you know that the reaction is done. At the moment, you can see this is still glowing hot, but no ignition is taking place, so we know that the reaction is done. 
you can turn off the Bunsen burner and leave the crucible to cool. Allow it to cool completely before proceeding with the next step. Using a medicine dropper, add a small volume of water to turn the solid in the bottom of the crucible into a thick paste. You'll do this by stirring it up with a glass stirring rod. Ensure that all the material remains within the crucible, so wipe off the stirring rod on the edge of the crucible before you complete this step. Return the crucible to the Bunsen burner and heat it once again. This will complete the formation of the magnesium oxide. This process will take several minutes, but you can check on it periodically, and once it is all light gray color, the reaction is complete. After the drying process, allow the crucible to cool before weighing it. Make sure that it is cooled completely before you proceed with this step. Obtain and record the final mass of the crucible and the solids within it. Finally, clean and scrub the crucible to remove any of the solids to ensure that it is completely clean before returning it. By the way, it's, it's a great reaction fun to raw. Oh, by the way, I should tell you, I used by the way twice. Gotta stop using that. But anyways, uh, if you ever meet organic chemists and the good ones when they were young were pyromaniacs and they like to burn things and burning magnesium is fun. If you've ever seen the movies where in the World War II, they'd shoot up something and a parachute would come down with something burning at the end that light up the battlefield, that's magnesium. That's how bright it is. Uh, I played with it when I was in high school, it's fun. But uh, if you look at the video, if you look inside, and this is something you should think, remember, magnesium oxide is a white powder. Magnesium is a shiny silver-like metal. It's not silver, it's magnesium. It's a metal. And that will help you with one of the questions. Oh, by the way, <laughs> no, you don't have any magnesium in your kit. And you know, I would never burn that in my house. If you burn that in your house, you wouldn't have a house anymore. Um, the temperatures get up to a couple thousand degrees Fahrenheit. So all you have to do, which I have actually shown you, is watch the video and you'll see right now, I'll give you the data. By the way, thank you for your question. All questions are good questions. And once again, no, you don't have any magnesium. If you do have, don't do it in your house. Uh, do we have time for, oh, we do. Don't tell anybody. But there are some students in high school who are in this group called Science Seminar, who are the best science students. And they had, which was pretty stupid back then, but we loved it. We had our own lab, just for us, unsupervised and complete access to the storeroom. And some of the boys, one near Halloween, took a couple rolls, 50, 25, 50 feet, magnesium uh, metal, ribbon it's called, threw it up in the trees, so it was like 20 foot lengths, and lit it at night. It lit up the whole block. It was quite impressive. But no, never burn magnesium in your house. And but if we were in the lab, we'd be doing it. All right, let's get back to our lab. And here's the experimental procedure if you were actually in the lab. Again, just in case. By the way, that's called overkill. And also this way you can't sue me if you burn down your house. But again, you don't have any magnesium in your kit. All right, let's get back to work. Now, you would have done this procedure. First of all, you'd heat a crucible. They don't show that, just to clean it out. When it cooled, you would weigh it with the cover. Then you'd add magnesium metal, a certain amount, 
the lab manager at COD uh, cuts him the right length. So all you have to do is weigh it in a crucible, record that weight, then you'd heat it just like they showed you. Note if you see a white flame, cover it and then uncover it. And then when all the magnesium is a white powder, that means the white powder is magnesium oxide, then remove them once and burn or let it cool. Then add 15 drops of distilled water. Now in that video they had where you stirred it around with a glass stirring rod. I never have my students do that. It's not necessary. And generally students might break or knock over the crucible by doing that or burn themselves. So I don't, and it works fine. Then you'll heat it, uh, crucible for about five minutes, let it cool, and then you'll weigh it, and then you clean up just like they had in the movie. All right, Dr. White's giving you the data, but you've got to do some work too. All right, first of all, here's the initial uh, the weight of the crucible magne uh, cover and magnesium. Here's the weight of the crucible and the crucible cover. This is one, this is two. One minus two, number three is the weight of the magnesium. You will need to calculate this number. And I made it sort of student friendly. Thank you, Dr. White, you're welcome. And that's the first thing. Now, after you've done it, you weigh the crucible, crucible cover and magnesium oxide, the white powder in there and you get this weight, number four. From up above here, Number two, which I rewrote for you, is the weight of the crucible cover and the crucible. If you subtract four minus two, you'll get the weight of magnesium oxide. And this is what you also have to do, which I'll call number five. Now, what you have to do, and here's how you do the lab, is find out what was the weight of the, now it's important and I have it underlined, the oxygen atoms, we're not talking O2. So how do you do that? You take five minus three. That's the weight of the oxygen atoms. Now, here's something important, which I show you. One mole of an element, or the number of moles of the element, I guess I shouldn't, I should have taken Moles of an element equals atomic weight, weight of the element divided by the atomic weight of the element in grams. Try and use proper significant figures, but don't worry about it if you don't exactly do it right. I won't take all points. Don't tell the instructor I said that. Now, you're gonna have to do the following. You'll do this calculation, then you'll calculate the moles of magnesium. How do you do that? And that's, you take the weight of magnesium, which you calculated right here, number three, I'm making this too easy for you. Number three divided by atomic weight of magnesium. Now, calculate the moles of oxygen. Again, this is atom, not O2. And that would be the weight of oxygen divided by the atomic weight of oxygen. I'm uh, making this too easy for you. I have to turn this lab into only one point. No, I'm just kidding. And not O2, oxygen atom. Now you're gonna have two numbers here. Let's call this A, let's call that B. On my original this morning, you can tell my back's doing better. I'm not as much pain, almost 80% gone, which is a good thing. Now, you'll divide for number four, 
you'll divide the moles of magnesium, answer to calculation two, so I really made this user friendly, by the smaller number in calculation two or three, and round it off to the nearest whole number. This is important. You can't have X and Y as a fraction or a decimal. It's going to be a whole number, one, two, three, four, five, whatever. And that will be your X in MGX. Now, number five calculation, do the same thing, except now take the moles of oxygen, your answer to calculation three or problem three, and divide it by which is a smaller two or three. One of those two, four or five, is gonna, well, you'll see what happens. And then, this is important one, I'll take off a million points if you don't get this, no I won't. You have to figure out the magnesium formula, oxide empirical formula. That means you're gonna write right here We're not using X. Use whole numbers. So you're going to have something like MG and some number here, not X or Y, and then O and some number here, not Y. And that will be just like example calcium chloride Notice here it's one and here it's two. But here you're going to do this for this lab and find out what are X and Y. And that's today's lab. Other than you've got to answer also all the questions here. One, two. Oh my God, how nice am I? Only two questions. Oh, now I got to. And read it. And. That's today's lab. And like I said, watch the video again. It's cool. Any questions? Remember, this lab will be due next week. Speaking about labs, if you go to Blackboard, you'll see the last lab you handed in last week. I graded and posted the uh, scores. Because the problems I've been having with my back, it's better, but still, uh, it's actually last night it was still telling me you were a bad boy. But anyways, I'm feeling a lot better <laughs> than my sewer work. Well, that's just a hole in my pocketbook, but it's painful that way, but not in my body. Well, my mind, not really. If you handed in anything late, between now and Monday, I will go back and grade anything you handed in late. If you haven't handed in labs and you can't upload it to Blackboard because you missed the cutoff date, don't tell anybody I'm being nice because of my image, but mainly because of the fact we're online, email me any late labs that you can't upload to Blackboard. The reason I'm doing that if we were in COD in the labs and I were with you, what I would be doing is I'd be going around and nudging you. How many of you have ever heard the word nudge? No, nope. well, it's time for me to teach you a new word. Nudge is a Yiddish word. Yiddish, if you don't know what it is, is a mixture of German and Hebrew uh, spoken by Jewish people in Germany, Poland, Russia, that area, all my grandparents came from Russia, and I learned from them some Yiddish, and nudge means to pester, bother you. I come by and I say, you know, you didn't hand in a lab last, or last week, please hand it in. Well, I forget, and I should be doing that by email, and I'm trying to get better on that. Things have just been piling up, and hopefully they'll get better. But since I haven't been able to nudge you about handing in the labs, that's why I'm allowing this. But get them in. They're easy points. All right. Any questions? Going once, going twice. All right. You can take your safety goggles off. If we're in the lab at COD, you are required once we start the lab to put on your own safety goggles. 
and I'd wear mine, you'd have gloves on too, to protect you. All right, now I promised today I'd go through chapter seven practice problems, so I better keep my promise. And by the way, this is in the practice problem answers in Blackboard. Now, remember when you're balancing chemical equations and test two, I guarantee, better yet, Remember I told you the first day you learn a lot about me? As far as I know, I've never really broke my promise to anybody else, but I know for a fact, 100%, I've never broken a promise to myself, never. So in front of all of you, I'm gonna promise on test two, there's gonna be four balancing chemical equations where you have to do that. Three points each, 12 points, that's a lot of points. And therefore, this is something you should do. Also, the lab that's due today is more practice, so make sure you do it. And let's go through a couple of things you should know. When you balance a chemical equation, you have the same number and same type of atoms on both sides of the arrow. Everybody see my whiteboard? Thank you. Oh, I don't want red. Remember when we're talking about a balanced chemical equation, the compounds at the base of the arrow are called the reactants. But if you worked in industry like I have for most of my life, they're also called the starting materials. At the head of the arrow, this side, whether you work in academics or industry, it's called the product. If there's more than one product, they're product. Now, when we balance a chemical equation, the first one on the practice problem was this. On the lab you're handing in, which I took some of them from the internet, I think there were two problems where it was already balanced. On my test, if I ask you to balance chemical equation, you'll have to balance it. It will never be correct on my test or finals. And I put this on my final too, I always have. You will have to balance chemical equations. So how do you tell what to do? You look and say one sodium, one sodium, two chlorine, ooh, one chlorine. How do I get two chlorine? You can't change the number, but you can change the coefficient, the number in front. And I'll put two here. Now I have two chlorine, but I also have two sodium. Oh, I only have one sodium here. How do I make it two like that? So I have two sodium. And I'll check two sodium, two sodium, two chlorine, two chlorine. It's balanced. Now, an important thing I've taught you, but I'll remind you again. What if you did this? Dr. White's going technicolor, and I just did a generation gap on you. When I was a kid, all the movies, when they came out with much better color movies, 
They said, now in Technicolor. Why is this wrong? Because if you can divide all the coefficients by one number and get whole numbers, then you don't have a multiple. You want to get the simplest. So if I divide this by two, I'll get this. Divide this by two, I'll get this. And divide this by two, I'll get this. And that's why this is the correct one. Always check that you can't divide all the coefficients by one number and get whole numbers. If you get fractions, then you don't have to change it. And that's why this is incorrect. And I could have also said eight sodium plus four chlorine gives eight sodium chloride. If you notice, if you divide each of these by four, it'll take you back to there. And again, this is also wrong for the same reason. So make sure you, when you're writing your answers down, you check that. All right, now another one, and by the way, I had a mistake here. That should be a aluminum. I don't know what it was I had there. Lithium. I changed the problem and I forgot to change that one. But this is an example of even odd, which I taught you. What is even and odd? If you have one side has an even number of an atom and the other has an odd. And at that point, you employ the strategy, or as I like to call it a trick, it's not really a trick, that Dr. White came up with. I'm sure I'm not the only chemist who uses this. Let's take a look at that problem. And if we look here, notice I have two oxygens here and three oxygens there. It's even and odd. Hopefully you all know what even and odd is. If not, look it up on Google. By the way, I just did another generation gap. I rarely ever use Google as a verb. I use it as a noun. Oh, my second grade teacher would be so happy with me. I use noun and verb in a sentence. But anyways, back to here. There's no way I can multiply three by a whole number and get two. Same thing here. So how do you get them equal on each side? Multiply this times this and you get six, which they both go into. What do I multiply two times to get six? Three, I now have six oxygen. What do I multiply three times to get six? Two. I now have six oxygen. Oh, they're balanced. But now we look at aluminum. Two times two is four aluminum. And here, how do we get four aluminum? Put that and let's check if it's balanced. Four aluminum, four aluminum, six oxygen, six oxygen. And that's how you do that. Now notice I can't divide these numbers by another number and get whole numbers. So this is the simplest or the correct balanced chemical equation. Again, let me go through how you do even and odd. Here, you look and see you have on one side two oxygen, the other three. How do you get it to be a number that they both can, by changing the coefficient, equal? You say this times this is six. How do I get six on this side? Put a three there. How do I get six on this side? Put a two in front of here. Two times three is six. And then I figure, oh, two times two, four aluminum. And I put a four in there. That's what I call
even odd problems or strategy or trick, whichever word you want to use, but it works. Now, let's look at number seven. Everybody, can you see number seven? Thank you. All right, how do we do number seven? Remember the other thing, and let me write this down, hang in there. So I can do it on my whiteboard. All right, everybody see the whiteboard with aluminum and sulfuric acid on there? I'm assuming, thank you. All right. Next, what you should remember is important strategy is leave oxygen and hydrogen for last. It's always worked for me. So in that case, I'm going to start this way. I say, oh, I have one aluminum, but on this side, I have two aluminum. Well, how do I get two aluminum on this side? I'll put a two in front of there. Oh, that's a funky looking two. Hold on. That's better. And now I have two aluminum. I come here. Oh, Dr. White says, leave oxygen and hydrogen last, so I'm gonna follow my advice. And I have sulfur here, one there. How many sulfur here? One, but remember you have the bracket and the number three, so I have three sulfur, whoops. Three sulfur, how do I get three sulfur on this side? Put the number three there. So now I have three sulfur. Well, it says leave oxygen, hydrogen last. That's all I have left. On this side, three times two, six hydrogen. Because in aluminum, there's no hydrogen. Oh, I only have two here. How do I get that to six? I put a three there. Three times two is six hydrogen. Well, all I have left is oxygen. And here I have three times four. And what is that? 12 oxygen. And here I have four, what's inside the bracket, outside the subscript is the number three, three times four is 12 oxygen. And if I look here, I'll check and I'll say two aluminum, two aluminum on each side, three sulfur, three sulfur, looking good, six hydrogen. Six, wow, looking really better. And 12 oxygen, 12 oxygen. It's balanced success. Now, all the stuff I have under here that I'm circling now, do you have to put that on a test? No. What you would have to do is this one I show you here, two aluminum, three sulfuric acid. That's what H2SO4 is. You have two aluminum sulfate or one aluminum sulfate, I'm sorry, plus three hydrogen gas. And that's how you do it. Leave, let me write it again. And leave oxygen and hydrogen for last. You don't have to. 
but it makes your life so much easier and makes the solution uh, you finding it so much quicker. And it's always worked for me, always. If you notice the rest of these, I do the same. Here's another example where you do the iron first, then the sulfur, and then you do the oxygen. Remember, you add the atoms in all molecules on this side, and you add the atoms in, say, oxygen, all on this side. If we look at the balanced chemical equation on this side, how many oxygen? One times three times two is six, plus three times four is 18. On this side, one times four times three is 12. Six times one is six. 12 plus six is 18 and stop. Here's another example of even odd. And the rest are self-explanatory. Any questions on balancing chemical equations? Well, I haven't said this in a long time, so I better remember in my class, in my world, in my life, there's no such thing as a dumb question ever. And guess what? I practice what I preach. And therefore, any questions on the lab? Not the lab, the practice problem. All right, I think it's a time for us to take a break so I can check how my plumbers are doing outside. Maybe take a picture of the hole they're digging. Uh, <laughs> but they, I'll make it right. These guys are really good. Again, JS Plumbing, really good. Come back in five minutes. That would be actually six minutes. I'm going to give you an extra minute. I'm under, I got to go check that. At 10.50, come back and we'll continue. I'll be back. Oh, 
All right, let's get back to work. Dr. White was just checking outside. They're still digging. And they had a few questions to ask me. That's why I took an extra whole minute. I'm sorry. But anyways, all right. Let me just get rid of something here. All right. I've covered everything for test number two, other than what I did like on Tuesday, the extensive practice. On next Tuesday, I'll go through the chapter eight practice problems, and I'll also uh, go through, uh, well, not go through, I'll do my world famous review for next test, test number two. So be sure to show up and follow me or watch the video. I'm glad I'm able to post my videos on YouTube because that allows you to uh, follow along. All right, now we're gonna start chapter 11. Chapter 11 will not be on test two, but it will be on test number three. So, but I want to get going because if you look at the syllabus, we're supposed to cover it this week. All right, everybody, have your attention. Everybody, take a deep breath. Let it out. Let it out. Or 
blow on your hand. And what do you feel? You feel the air. And the air is a gas. Remember the three states of matter, solid, liquid, gas. And a gas is something that has indefinite shape, indefinite volume. But in this chapter, we're going to learn more about what are gases, important things about gases, which helped in the development, I'll talk a little about, things like the Industrial Revolution of the 1700s, and even your gas engine in your car. Those all involve gases. So let's get started. Everybody see chapter 11? Hold on. Yep, hopefully that's what everybody see. Thank you, thumbs up people. Thank you. All right, let's get going. Now, this slide, hold on, I better do this. The switches click off, this won't be on a test, but when we talk about gases, there are certain properties. Let's just think about gases, what are they? They consist of tiny particles that are far apart. And those particles are either atoms or molecules. And compared to solids and liquids, which they don't, they're not far apart. Gas particles are moving about rapidly. How many of you have ever felt the wind in your face? If you go outside today, like I was, when I was showing them where they, certain things they're asking me questions, I felt the wind on my face. I had a jacket on because it was getting cold out there. But anyways, and what's that wind? That's molecules of oxygen, nitrogen hitting you, and you feel it. What you don't realize right now, they're molecules of oxygen, nitrogen pressing on your skin. I'll talk more about that in a second, maybe 10 seconds. Now, Gas particles have little effect on one another unless they collide. And as I said, gases expand to fill their containers. In other words, they have uh, indefinite volume. Now, let's talk about what's called the kinetic molecular theory or sometimes called the kinetic theory of gases. And this is one where switches off, but it's still good to know. Gases consist of mainly small particles, atoms or molecules that move randomly. That means they're just zigging around at rapid velocities. The term velocity means both speed and direction. For those of you who've had math, it's a vector. Well, I haven't used that word in a long time. And they're a collection of particles that are always in motion. Attractive forces between particles is non-existent, can be neglected. Again, switches off on these slides, but I do want to cover it. The actual volume of a gas occupied by the gas molecules is extremely small to the volume the gas occupies because the molecules are far apart. And the average kinetic energy, how much motion they have, how fast they're going, is proportional. Now, here we're going to be doing this. We haven't used it this semester yet. The Kelvin temperature, not Fahrenheit, not Celsius, Kelvin temperature. The speed of particle increases as you increase the Kelvin temperature. And gases are always moving around. And they're normally going in a straight path until they hit another molecule of gas, sort of like balls on a billiard or pool table. They're, if you roll one, it's going to go straight until it hits another ball on a billiard or pool table. All right, let's talk about key properties of gases. One is pressure. How many of you have ever checked your car tire pressure? Your ones, you have it on your dashboard, your speedometer, 
a little numb gauge that will tell you. And what are you doing? You're checking the gas in your tires. That you never think about. Your car tires are chemistry. Your whole car is serious chemistry. Another thing we can measure is volume. How much? We can measure the temperature of a gas and you can measure the amount. Amount would be the weight in grams which you can convert to moles. Guess what? You know how to do that. Well, I hope you do by next Thursday. So, oh, by the way, I'll never ask you what are key properties of gases. Now, let's talk about gas pressure. For this slide, it switches off. What I mean by that, I won't ask this ever, what is the definition of pressure? but it's good to know where it came from. Pressure is defined as force applied per unit area. That's the total force on a surface divided by the area of surface. Pressure, force, and sometimes you'll hear me just say force per unit area. Force divided by area, unit area. Now, right now, you don't feel it because it's been on you your whole life from the day you were born, unless you were born in a spaceship in outer space. Any of you born in a spaceship in outer space? Uh-oh, Dr. White's getting silly. I do that. But anyways, right now on your skin, there's gas pushing on it. But you don't feel it. Why? Because it's been doing it your whole life. From the minute or second you were born, you, unless you were conjured, now I'm being silly again, you're going to have gas pushing on your skin. And we have a name for that. And we call that atmosphere pressure. The atmosphere is the gas around us, surrounding us in the atmosphere. And that's atmospheric pressure. How do you measure? It's measured with a barometer. And a barometer is a device that measures atmospheric pressure. Hang in there. Can everybody see on their screen right now a picture of a mercury barometer? Okay, good. Now, I'll never ask you to draw one. <laughs> and if we look here, this is a barometer. Originally, back in the 1700s, when they first developed this, you had a little dish of mercury here and the atmospheric pressure would push down on the mercury, just like on your skin. And that would force the mercury up this evacuated tube, vacuum, to a certain height. And if you measure the distance from the top of the pool of mercury in the dish to the height in the tube, you would get a length. And being in Europe, use millimeters. And that's how you measure atmospheric pressure. And these are called, this is the old mercury barometer. And you can see, let me get a picture of a better one.
trying to find a good one. Uh, if you look in the picture on the right, I've been in labs where you have mercury barometers. There's mercury down here and you measure the height. And that way you get the barometric pressure. They don't have them anymore because mercury is a very dangerous chemical. You get mercury vapor into your body, enough of it, it will kill you. And mercury is a poison your body doesn't know how to get rid of, so it accumulates. And that's why if you look now, they don't use mercury thermometers. When I was a little kid, my parents had, and I even had one until they came out with the digital ones. I still have the mercury one, a mercury thermometer, because that mercury is dangerous. Then in the 1980s or 90s, they realized this is dangerous stuff. And that's when they got rid of mercury barometers in the labs. But you measure a height. And because of that, mercury or atmospheric pressure, one measure is millimeters of mercury. And it's shown by this, one mm millimeter Hg, you know, is mercury. Now, the person who invented the barometer and did a lot of great work on gases is the Italian chemist, or I don't even know if when he did it, they were called chemists, Torricelli. And to honor the great work Torricelli did, we also have a unit of pressure called the Tor, his name shortened down. And by definition, one millimeter mercury equals one Tor. And in the past, I would tell students, you've got to memorize this now, but since I'm not asking you to memorize a lot, I've cut way down about two years ago, I started doing this. In test number three, three one, two, three, I'll have important information. I'll give you that one millimeter mercury equals one Tor. And again, Tor, and I'll never ask this on a test, is named in honor of Tor Selly. Let's do something, I got time. If you go to Google, oh, I love, hold on one sec. If you go to uh, uh, Wikipedia, you'll see a picture of him, great mustache. And when was he doing this? Wow, in the early 19, uh, 1600s, a student of Galileo, I didn't know that, and he invented the barometer. And that's why in his honor, we call him, or the name is after him. And notice they show one of his very early barometers. And he's done some other things too. I'll let you, oh, there's a stamp of him too. I'm gonna have to look who put this out. That looks Russian. Yep. Well, formal USSR. I'll look on uh, Wikip uh, not Wikipedia, eBay. But anyways, one millimeter mercury equal one Tor. Now, it turns out that at sea level, like here in the Chicagoland area, if you measure the atmospheric pressure when there's no, and by the way, just a quick check. Everybody see in red 760 mm Hg on your color TV? No, I'm just kidding. On your monitor, good. All right. At sea level, like here, when there are no storms going by, the pressure, atmospheric pressure, turns out to be 760 millimeters of mercury. Because one millimeter mercury equals one tor, we know that. 
760 millimeters of mercury equal 760 torr. Now, because this is so important and for things I'll show you later, we chemists came up with another unit of measure for barometric pressure called the atmosphere. By the way, this slide switches on. If I could turn the switch to only goes to a dial goes to 10, I just turned it to 20. And you, it is defined 760 millimeters of mercury, which is also 760 torr, equals one atmosphere. And notice I say know this. In the past, I'd say remember this, and I really should say know how to use this. So it's important. 760 millimeters of mercury equal one atmosphere equals 760 torr. Now I'm gonna come back to that in a second. There are other units which the switch is off for this slide. Other pressure, if you listen to your weather forecast, they'll talk about what's the barometric pressure. And instead of millimeters, because we're in the United States, they use inches of mercury. And turns out, and the switch is totally off for this slide, 29.9 inches of mercury is one atmosphere. Hold on, I see a question. Wow. Thank you, Camille. Wow, it's... Time for Dr. White to get goofy. It's time to celebrate Torres Sully's birthday. Wow. I think the fates are trying to tell me something. I talked about Torres Sully on his birthday. Write that down in your diary and tell your grandchildren to tell their Isn't that interesting? Did you time it that way? What? <laughs> Did you no, time it that way? No, the fates above planned it that way. Oh. <laughs> Thank you for telling me. I appreciate it. Wow. Yeah. That's spooky. Ooh. Amazing. I'm going to have to tell my other colleagues later today. I talked about Torricelli on his birthday, and one of my students was nice enough to point that out. Thank you. Now, another measure of pressure is PSI. Again, switches off, and PSI is pounds per square inch. Again, force per unit area. And where do you see PSI? Things like your tire, tire pressure, tire pressure. Right now, my car tires, because I have an SUV, are kept at roughly 35 PSI, which I check once a month, and you should too. And 14.7 PSI is one atmosphere. Now, one of the things Dr. White has done, and I won't be able to talk about it in this class, but there's certain reactions I have done, a lot of them, at very high pressure with gases like hydrogen and ammonia in chemical plants. And there, I've been up at 600 PSI which is like 20, 30 atmospheres. And if you don't do things right, it can be very dangerous. Good news, I survived. And, but you have to be careful at high pressure. And now it's time for pressure practice time. Let me remind you, one millimeter of mercury equal one tor. Happy birthday, Torricelli. Again, thank you again for pointing it out. Also, you should know how to use 760 millimeter of mercury equal 
760 tor equal one atmosphere, which is abbreviated by ATM. Not to be confused with where you get your money at a bank, which I never use those, never have. I always plan ahead. And let's do a couple. I'll do a couple, three points each. How many tour? Let me just say I haven't done it in a while. Everybody see my whiteboard? How many tour? Thank you, thumbs up, people. All right, so how do you do this? Well, you say, what am I trying to find? Tour. What am I given? I'm given this. And guess what? It's time to use your good friend, your good buddy, unit analysis. <laughs> I love that whistle. I need to pick me up with my sewer work going on. <laughs> but anyways, how do you use your good buddy, your good friend with this? We have 475.6. Now, this one, you really didn't have to use it, but still, it's good practice. What do I want to get to? Tor. How do you use the unit analysis? Oops. Why aren't you going red? Let's try you. There we go. Whatever you're trying to get to goes on top. Whatever you're trying to get rid of goes underneath. And therefore, and we're talking about the units, I have tor here, and I have millimeters of mercury here. And this is one, check up here, one tor equal one millimeter mercury. These are part of a definition. Those are exact numbers. And therefore, do the math, the answer is, notice I start with four significant figures, I better end up with four significant figures. Oops. Hold on. And you get 475.6 tor. I'll let you try this. I why don't you try this one? Because I'm going to share the font. How many millimeters H G is mercury is 308 tor. And remember, one millimeter mercury equals one tor. Don't forget to use your good buddy, your good friend, unit analysis. Remember, I'm still going for the Guinness Book of World Record, saying that the most times in one semester. Anybody keeping count for me?
and when you're done, look up and smile if you have your video on or give me a thumbs up. Oh, I wonder if Zoom ever thought of putting nail polish on the thumbs. That would be an X, never mind. All right, let's do this. Everybody's done, I hope. All right, so the question is, how do you determine how many millimeters of mercury is 308 torque? So what are we trying to find? Millimeters of mercury. What are we given? 308 torque. And what do you know? One millimeter mercury equal one torr. This will give you given to you an important information. So I'll use my good buddy, my good friend, unit analysis. This is what I have to start with. What am I trying to get? Millimeters of mercury. And whatever I'm trying to get to. I'll put on top of the ratio, whatever I'm trying to get rid of, I'll put underneath. And on top, I want millimeters of mercury. And here I want tor. And we know that's one millimeter mercury is one tor. Tor cancels out. And these are exact numbers. This is three significant. I better end up with three significant. And that's your answer. Let's do another one. And I'll do this one. And the question is, how many ATM, remember this is atmospheres, is 458 millimeters of mercury. So what are we trying to find? ATM, and I could have put how many atmospheres of oxygen is 458 millimeters mercury oxygen, O2, but I could also put it like I just said. What are we given? And so it's time to use our good buddy, our good friend, unit analysis. This is what I have. What am I trying to get to unit wise? I can do it in one step. I'm trying to get to atmospheres, ATM. And now I'll use my good buddy my good friend, unit analysis, whatever I'm trying to get to goes on top. Whatever I'm trying to get rid of goes underneath. And where do I get these numbers that go in this ratio? Well, I go back that this definition, this is the definition. 760 millimeters of mercury equals one atmosphere. 760 millimeters of mercury equal one atmosphere. So if I come down here, for every one atmosphere, there's 760 millimeters of mercury. 760 is an exact number. One is an exact number. Therefore, I start out with three significant figures here. My answer should be three significant figures. And now it's time for me to go to my calculator. Let me open it up. I haven't needed it yet today. And I'll take and check to make sure you can see what I'm doing, which you can. Everybody see the spreadsheet now? Thank you. 
I'll take plus 458 divided by 760. And this is the number my calculator gives me. And I'm going to let you round that off to three significant figures, because that's what we have to do. And I'll explain why again. I'll give you three more seconds. Uh, I'm going to take some water. I'll give you a little more. I ran out of tea, at least up here. All right, time's up. Rounding us off to three significant figures. Zeros to the right, to the left of the decimal are never significant. Six is my first. Zero after decimal R. Zero, two is my second one. Two is my third. I use six to round off. That's five or higher. Drop the six, three, one, and six. Increase the two to by one to three. So that'd be 0 0.603. Okay, how many atmospheres is 841.5 millimeters of mercury? And if you don't have a calculator, just set it up for today, and then I'll do the math for you. Am I nice or am I nice? Don't answer that. Uh-oh, it's awful humor Thursday. Just think, you have to pay for the hear me say that. And please be patient. I try and give everybody time to finish. When you're done, give me a thumbs up or smile. Let me check everybody else. I think everybody's done. Let's do it. All right. So look at this. What are we being asked to find? How many ATM? What are we giving? this. So I'm going to use my good friend, my good buddy, unit analysis. This is all I have to start with. I could somehow use some ratio. What am I trying to get to units? ATM. 
I'm going to use my good buddy, my good friend, unit analysis, whatever I'm trying to get to goes on top. Whatever I'm trying to get rid of goes underneath. Where do I get these numbers? I get those numbers from the fact that 760 millimeters of mercury equals 760 tor equal one atmosphere. And I forgot to write this in. Atmospheres goes on top. Millimeters of mercury goes here. This is one. This is 760. Notice I have four significant figures here. My answer should have four significant figures because these are exact numbers. They're part of a definition. So now it's time for me. No, it's not time for me to go yet to my calculator. I'm going to look millimeters of mercury divided by millimeters of mercury. Anything divided by itself equals number one. Cancels out. I'm left with atmospheres. So now I can go to my calculator. And hopefully you saw I put 841.5 divided by 760. I get this number. And now, remember, we're supposed to have four significant figures. I'll let you round this off, the four significant figures. Time's up. Ah, keep the one, keep the one, keep the zero, keep the seven. Those are my four. Use the two to round off. That's four or less. Drop it. So it'd be 1.107 atmospheres. And that would be the answer. Oh, let's do one more of these. And I'll let you try this one. How many atmospheres is 876 tor? And since you may not be able to see it up above, I'll write this here. Because this will be in one an important information. And it's your turn. And when you're done, give me a thumbs up if you're in the mood.
you're not in the mood, don't do it. All right, anybody need more time? Yell out if you do. Go once, twice. All right, let's do this. What are we being asked to find? How many ATM atmospheres? What are we given? 760 Tor. Happy birthday, Tor Sally. Again, thank you for letting me know about that. And this is all we have to start with. What units do I want my answer in? And now it's time to use my good buddy, my good friend, unit analysis. Whatever I'm trying to get to goes on top. Whatever I'm trying to get rid of goes underneath. And therefore, I'll write in. Atmosphere is on top, tour on the bottom. Where do I get that number? Right here, which will be an important information. Test number three. Remember, this is stuff will be on test three. 760 tour equal one atmosphere. One atmosphere, 760 tour. These are both exact numbers, and therefore, this is the only number that tells me how many significant figures my answer should be. That's three significant figures. Therefore, my answer should be three significant figures. This is a multiplication division. And now, before I go to my calculator, tor divided by tor equals one, because anything divided by itself equals number one, cancels out. I'm left with atmospheres. Ooh, that's what I want. And now I will go to my calculator. And hopefully, does everybody see the calculator on their screen? Or the spreadsheet? Good, thank you. And now, we want three significant figures. I'll let you round that off to three significant figures. Time's up. Uh, keep the one, keep the one, keep the five, my three significant figures. Use the two to round off. Is that four or less? Yes, so I'll drop that. That becomes 1.15. And that's three significant figures. And that's how you do these kind of calculations. If I look at the clock, I'm going to do something which I normally don't, but I think I, we're ahead of schedule, so I know I can do that. I'm going to let you go a little early. Shh, don't tell the dean. But actually, this is a uh, not a DCM, but an asynchronous course, so I don't even have to do what I'm doing now but I am giving you a full week of lecture time. Thank you, Dr. White. But anyways, Dr. White's being silly. With that, I'm going to say, don't forget, do the practice problems, study. Test number two is next Thursday. Between now and Tuesday, make sure you do chapter eight practice problems. If you haven't done the other ones, do that. Don't forget the lab that's due today that we did last week, talked about balanced chemical equations are due today. And also, um, don't forget on Monday, I have my office hours, have a nice rest of the week. And weekend, I'm gonna say, I'm to say goodbye for the week. Have a great week. Uh, say a prayer for my sewer line. No, it doesn't need to. JNS Plumbing does a great job. And I'm gonna say, Gang gesund, be healthy. I'll see you next Tuesday. Bye.